Hello. Hello. And welcome to the Cookbook Circle podcast. I'm Hannah. And I'm Victoria. And we've set out to review the UK's most popular cookbooks, those that you probably have at home and haven't opened in a while. We take one cookbook each episode to cook from and to stress test, digging out their best recipes, bringing them to life again, and hopefully inspiring you to do so too. Hello, hello. Uh, hi. What have you been up to? What have you been looking at? Um, Not very much because we are still in lockdown, but there's a cookbook I'm lusting after. Oh. Yeah, this week or last week, the Radio 4 Food Program did a program on how to eat to save the planet. And they interviewed Tom Hunt. He has a book called Eating for Pleasure, People and the Planet. And oh. it's like a mixture of recipe, like beautiful recipes of kind of uh, local food and what you can do with local food, eat locally, as they say. And, uh, you know, a bit of a kind of political book about why you should do that. That sounds interesting. Yeah, so it's, it sounds really interesting. They were also talking about this company that does British grown beans and pulses. Ah. So now I'm obsessed with that. They will serve you well now, post Brexit, won't they? Do we get beans and pulses <laughs> anymore that we've closed <laughs> off the entire world? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> waitros are in dire straits. They've got no lentil. <laughs> that is the most middle class thing you've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we digress. Should we get to it? Yes. Uh, Hannah, tell us what this week's cookbook is. Well, in case you forgot what we do here, Victoria and I, we collected as many um, of the best cookbook lists as we could find online to make our own kind of definitive rundown of the most popular ones. Each podcast, we take one of the books, cook some of the recipes, share our thoughts with you, what we liked, what we didn't like. And this time it's... Plenty. Hi, <laughs> Tam. Okay, we love you. Well, I love your Tam, but I'm sure there'll be lots of that to come. <laughs> come on, hit me with some facts. Okay, so he grew up in Jerusalem. An interesting fact I found out about him, which I love, is that he is very surprisingly academic, mostly academic. So he uh, has an undergrad and a master's degree in comparative literature. Wow. Were you comparing the books? Is that what one does? I don't know. That sounds very intelligent. It does sound intelligent. He was living in Amsterdam, editing a magazine, and he was planning to go and do his PhD in comparative literature. So there must be a lot of things to compare. (laughs) And then, as you do, uh, similar to your story, I think, he uh, just decided to go to the Cordon Bleu in London instead. Yeah, so similar. I was... Definitely wasn't just sick of a career in marketing. He went in London, though, didn't he? Yeah, so he did that in pastry and then went off to do the boring West London fine dining restaurants that I have no interest in talking about. Um, Yeah, then 2006, he got his Guardian column, which, you know, is renowned across the globe. 15 years, that's crazy. Yeah, still going. He focuses on vegetables in that column still even now Mm -hmm. but yeah that was a kind of um I think it was a bit of a I guess change at that point someone focusing on on vegetables and mostly vegetarian cooking uh which is obviously he's that's how he's made his name yeah which is really interesting I read a New York Times magazine kind of profile of him from back in 2016 I think um, where Sam Sifton said that his food is inspired by Israeli, Palestinian, Turkish, Syrian, Armenian, and Asian influences. So it's, it's a bit of everything. Unsurprisingly, because everybody loves him, he's won a number of awards. He's won everything, basically, from a Condé Nast Traveller Award to... A James Beard Award most Mm. recently. And, of course, all the Observer Food Monthly Awards that you could ever dream of. He's won a lot. But you could argue, and thus begins the fine girling, that he has changed so much. Because, yeah, that column would have been a bit of a game changer at the beginning in its focus on vegetables. And also the kind of common joke about him is this long list of ingredients that are really hard to find right yeah and and he credits himself 
I think in this book with, or not in this book, but maybe later on with bringing ingredients like za'atar and stuff to the shelves of Waitrose. <laughs> he does talk about that in this book. And then he, this is only, this is his second book. This book came out in 2010. Mm. So he'd have had his Guardian article for four years. His book came out prior to this. Yeah, he's done a, he did a lot in an incredibly short time. And I think that a lot of this is is definitely worthy of the awards. Yeah. You know, and everybody who cooks similar in, in a similar vein to this now is compared to Ottolenghi. And that's tough. Yeah, it totally is. He's, he's credited with those kind of like big sharing plates of colourful food and an overflowing like cake counter at all his places in London. When I was baking, it was very much like we should try to have an Ottolenghi style counter with all the kind of different levels and shapes and colours and everything. So yeah, he's he's done a lot really, to be fair to him. When does he sleep? <laughs> I don't know, he has two kids as well. Did I tell you I saw him once? No, tell me. I often say, because I tell this story all the time, even though nothing happened, um, I often say that for me, this was the equivalent of like seeing Mick Jagger. <laughs> and then my friend said, that's a really like old person <laughs> reference that I should stop using. But it was when I worked in Covent Garden and he had just opened this small little place um, that did like takeaway salads and sandwiches and stuff called Sesame. Mm. Um, that's just another thing we have in common is our shared love for Sesame. But he uh, was standing outside on the phone because it was the soft launch and he was obviously there to oversee everything. And I came down and saw him and I was genuinely agog. <laughs> I don't think that's the right use of that word, but flabbergasted. You know, there we go. Definite highlight of the day. Came back to the office, told people I'd seen him and they had no idea who the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> it was a good day all around. So, the book. I mean, you've already said that you thought it it's lovely, I think. It's lovely. It's a lovely book. <laughs> it's a lovely book. So, we know that you're an Ottolenghi fan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've mentioned. <laughs> Is this in your top Ottolenghi book? You will be shocked to hear, Victoria, that I don't have every Ottolenghi book. But I do have... <laughs> I have this and I have no, the Nopi book, which is more kind of fine dining and um, sweet, which is hands down favorite baking book ever. But that's for another day. So, yeah, I do. I, I really like this book. I have had it for a long time. I still feel like I've only cooked a small percentage of it. I kind of just come back to it in waves. It's got a lovely squishy cover, like for kids. <laughs> yes, love the squishy cover. Yeah, that was my thoughts. It feels like a kid's book. The front cover doesn't feel like a kid's book. But, you know, what, what a children's book to keep, teach your kid how to read. That are... <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what were your f first impressions when you looked at it? It's beautiful. It's, it's, yeah, it's really lovely. It is my first Ottolenghi book. <sighs> Wow. Because I haven't, I mean, I've probably cooked something from his Guardian um, column because cause why wouldn't I have done? Because it's like iconic. Mm. But I've never owned a book. I don't own plenty this book. I got it from the library because they don't depreciate in value. That's what I've learned. And they're still, you still have to buy them for 20 plus pounds. Yes. Which I think is a lot of money. But yeah, you, you, you can't get them. It's beautiful and the, the pictures are beautiful and I like that they don't have like wanky names for the dishes. It's all just a list of ingredients basically. It's very Nigel Slayer who we love. Yes. It made me want to read more Ottolenghi books. There you go. I'm a, I'm a changed woman. A lot of aubergine though, isn't there? So much aubergine. What's wrong with a nice aubergine now and again? Oh, nothing, nothing. I mean... <laughs> okay, I'm going to row down on the defensive here. I'm going to put my best <laughs> objective hat on. Yeah, yeah, loads of aubergines. Jeez. <laughs> Hannah, what did you cook? How did you stress test this book? I cooked a couple of things together. I cooked the soba noodles with the aubergine and mango. Mm. And with that, I thought it would be a nice uh, little side. I cooked the black pepper tofu. So the silver noodles are great. Could I find silver noodles? No. Now that I've left the dizzy heights of Stoke Newington with all of its harvests and um, <laughs> whole foods and all the like, yeah, yummy mummy shops, I couldn't find them anywhere in Southeast London. But I did use something called a Shanghai noodle. 
mm. which I mean, so we're a book week, I think. So Shanghai yeah. was a wheat one anyway. And it's a cold or like room temperature dish. So you make quite like a zingy dressing with lime and lots of kind of Asian-y bits. And you cook off some aubergine in batches. And then you mix it all together and you just kind of like let it mellow for a bit. That's what I like about all of his recipes, really, because when you're vegetarian and you just like (laughs) keep getting served mushrooms and, you know, chickpeas in various forms, he adds different dimensions with lots of acid and mango. That's kind of left field having there. And there's always loads of fresh herbs and stuff. So there's just lots going on, which I really like and different textures. The noodles... There was a, the occasional slippery noodle in there, not going to lie. <laughs> but maybe that wouldn't have happened with the soba. So, you know, that's my own fault for leaving uh, the N16 general area. Yeah, I feel like soba noodles are so good at being cold noodles, right? Like that's basically their MO. That's their jam. Yeah, they, they're made to be cold. If I spotted them again somewhere, I would probably have, a, have another go. But that was really good. But black pepper tofu... That's my that's my dish, man. I love it. So good. So good. <laughs> this is a this is a bit of an iconic one, no? This the black pepper tofu from this book. I feel like I see it a lot around, just walking around. <laughs> I'm in waitress. There's just, you know. It's a black pepper tofu in front of you in the lens <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I I think it was probably one of the big ones when it first came out. It's quite spicy and it very much depends on the chilies that you've used because I've made it a couple of times and the second time was with I did not see on the packet that it said extra hot chilies and they lived up to their name my mouth is on fire but it's so delicious because you've got ginger and loads of shallots and different things and you cook them all down butter and yeah there's chilies in there as well and then you um before you do that you cook off the tofu in corn flour which I mean I'm vegetarian. Don't know if I've mentioned that before. You're legally obliged to tell us at least once every 20 minutes, no? (laughs) Excuse me, that's a vegan. (laughs) No, I'm just joking, vegans. You're saving the planet. Uh, Tofu, yeah, it's like I haven't actually cooked it that much, which you think I would have, but I think it was, I've just always had it like a bit, a bit slimy, a bit, you know, like tofu, I don't know, scramble, Mm. or like even if you cook it diced without, corn flour it still kind of goes mushy and it's just a bit grim but so like this recipe for me was an eye-opener in that sense because you cook it off in the corn flour and it gets really crispy on the outside you put that aside and then you make your sauce is it like deep fried or shallow fry takes longer than you would think actually to get kind of you know looking palatable (laughs) um at least british tofu or tofu that we buy over here just doesn't really have much flavor does it yeah there's definitely a trick missing there and I think it's exactly because people making tofu here don't have to try that hard because they know that people are going to smother it in lovely black pepper sauce or um yeah some kind of delicious dressing whereas when you buy it in Asia yeah people eat it as is so it has to be somewhat delicious yeah totally it's just quite bland here not in this recipe, my friend. <laughs> You've got a lot of spice in there. Yeah, so you just kind of soften everything down, chilies, shallots, garlic, ginger, and then you add in, I think we're like three different types of soy sauce in there, not all of which I could obtain. And so a little bit of sugar. And at the end, you put in like five tablespoons of crushed black peppercorns. Ooh. Yeah then that's it really then you just kind of put the tofu back into warm but it's so delicious it's so spicy it's one of those dishes that you're eating and you it's hurting you but it's so flavorful that you keep eating it and like I kept coming back for more and more of it Mm. my mouth is actually watering that while I'm talking about it I haven't had dinner yet (laughs) so yeah that that is a really good recipe I would definitely recommend is it like a sticky sauce when when it's finished yeah It is quite a bit. You put quite the lump of butter, actually, which obviously pleased me to no end, into the sauce when you're cooking it down. So it all gets kind of like glossy and sticky and delicious. I mean, he just says to serve that tofu with steamed rice, which I feel like you could definitely do. Mm. Both of those dishes have quite enough going on in their own right. But I ate them together and had a little flavour party. (laughs) (laughs) A little sweet and spicy. Yeah mix up 
was the tofu well firstly was there any left and secondly was it good the next day if there was there was some left even though i kept going up after dinner and eating and munching more but i still miracle of miracle managed to leave some behind and it was really good the next day and it still stayed kind of crispy actually so oh that's great it'd be quite worth making up a big old batch of it and then you could heat it up what about you what did you make i made the spiced red lentils and cucumber yogurt mm. which is exactly what it says on the tin no wanky recipe name alert here nope Woo-hoo. um i only cooked one thing and we'll come back to that later but what this what i did cook was great really really lovely so the spiced in the title is is indian flavors so your classic got uh, garlic, ginger, chili, coriander, mustard seeds, cumin, mm-hmm. and curry leaves, which I couldn't find, much to my disgust. <laughs> I do live in a part of London that, that I thought would have it at this point. We've got these really, we have a lot of really lovely greengrocers nearby. Um, but it's okay, I got, I got dried and just added nice. extra, because that's what... The internet said to do if you've got dried and it was it was still great it's it's really easy actually so it's red lentils so they're fairly easy to to cook you soak them a little bit and then you make almost like a curry paste out of the an onion ginger garlic mm-hmm. and coriander stems but it's not quite a paste he says to leave it a little bit textured right which i guess adds to the just the texture of the dish which is really really nice You cook that up with all the good spices, the warm kind of cumin and the mustard seeds and all that good stuff. And then add the lentils and their soaking liquid and chopped tomatoes. So it's almost like a dal kind of, is it? Yeah, exactly. I think like a dal. I don't want to say that, yeah, it's like a dal, but it's lentils in a a sauce. Yeah, Yeah, it's good. And it's not, it feels really hearty, Mm. which is nice. It made loads. So I had it for lunch for about three days and I didn't get bored of it. It was fairly easy. Kind of just let it boil down. It made the house smell incredible. Uh, really, really nice. Love that. And yeah, you serve it with a, like a writer. So it's just a, it's just cucumber, yogurt, bit of olive oil, salt. You could make it vegan by making that into vegan yogurt, yeah. which would make the whole thing vegan. Apart from similarly to what you said about the tofu, actually, there's, there's a point where you mix some butter through it but you can admit that step I'm sure it would still be absolutely delicious and not have it have too much effect on the taste it's not a huge amount of butter I wonder if that's just what he learned in the cordon bleu was just to add butter to everything <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that is all you learn the art of French cooking is just add more butter than you think you need when you get your medal at the end it's just made entirely of butter <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great though um And you were able to find some lentils in Waitrose despite Brexit concerns. I think I got them from my from my local shop, so it was fine, which I'm you know, they're fully stocked all the time with every lentil you could possibly want. Every bean and lentil. (laughs) So I I think it could have I could have pushed it to be spicier. I would have maybe liked that. But it yeah, like I said, it's really hearty. It doesn't feel like you know, sometimes when you make something like that, it's it's too soupy. Yeah. To feel like you're really eating something yes and you need to eat half a loaf of bread with it to make it feel <laughs> make yourself feel full one of my highlights actually and again going back to the lovely greengrocers near my house is that I got this bunch of coriander to go in it you sprinkle coriander on at the end stir it through but you put the stalks are they called stalks yeah stems <laughs> in uh into the curry paste and I don't like coriander yeah sorry about that you're one of those i'm one of those but honestly this coriander i think may have changed my mind about coriander wow are you certain it was coriander (laughs) were they like dealing you some other kind of shady green herb (laughs) (laughs) well either way i'm ready to go back and buy more and again it's just a lesson in shopping local and and fresh and not relying on supermarkets but it's so fragrant but not in a overpowering way which is my one of my problems with coriander <laughs> do you have a list of problems yeah yeah that's a whole podcast <laughs> it's um probably worth mentioning that there is 
there are like recurring ingredients that come up again and again and again in his all of his recipes really you could say and coriander is probably one of them yeah I guess it's just the natural body to all the kind of Asian Middle Eastern vibes yeah and it get, does give that if you if you get the right one I'm, a, I'm an expert now <laughs> if you get the right one it does give that kind of freshness and yeah. and like you've just you know you've just whipped it up and yeah. picked the coriander from your garden or whatever oh, yeah absolutely loved it would make it again over and over because it was also the spices that I mentioned and ginger garlic and coriander like they're readily available yeah that leans into the reason I only cooked one thing because with a lot of the recipes in here and, and maybe Ottolenghi generally there's always something that you don't have and I think what's difficult because a lot of the ingredients are quite niche or yeah. obscure is that you don't know what to do to substitute them yeah 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 that's fair but I think maybe that's a bit of a critique of Ottolenghi from my side is that there's no way to kind of experiment and play around with them because there's if there's a recipe and there's three ingredients that you don't have I I, I just won't make it because yeah I feel like I've got this angry Ottolenghi figure on my shoulder is it me annoyed at me <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to say, but it's me. This little Irish Ottolenghi on my shoulder. <laughs> I know. I, I have been known to argue this point with people because, you know, people say, oh, it, yeah, you have to just go and buy a bag of sitar and Sichuan peppercorns and <laughs> whatnot for a single recipe. My only rebuff to that would be that once you have them then usually there's something that you buy in bulk and they can they're like a store cupboard thing that just sit there and that that means you can kind of make it again and again it's just finding the bloody things in the first place right yeah and we're in a very lucky position where we have these lovely shops there's a lot of places where we can get these things yeah. but when you can't it's this beautiful book that is just a reference book then you're never gonna cook from it and what you need on your shelves are books that you want to use and you can use so even now I think so this came out 11 years ago and so, things have changed so much and all a lot of this stuff is more readily available mm -hmm. but not everything I think that's something that you can see over the years up to this point that he has simplified a lot obviously I mean that book was called simple the one right before flavor because I know them all. Don't own them all, but know them all. Um, <laughs> that he he seems to be working through, you know. <laughs> He's really working through his um, over yeah. over in ingredientization. Like well, there's the recipe that was in Feast recently that was just curry butter beans on toast. Yeah, it's really good supper. It was it was in his column on working from home lunches or whatever. Um, me and my sister have made that a couple of times now because actually. You have everything? We actually have everything pretty much in the cupboard or the fridge. And I think you mightn't have been able to say that for one of his recipes like 11, 12 years ago. So I do feel yeah. um, like he's really overcoming these obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> do you follow him on Instagram? I think so, yeah. Oh, my God. Are we even friends? <laughs> <laughs> I think I do. He's always posting from the test kitchen. And I think it must just be the most amazing place to work. I would just die. You'd just be eating delicious food all of the time. I do have a lot of respect for the test kitchen. Yeah. Um, the fact that his recipes are just meticulously tested. That's because he has this real, you can tell he has this real commitment to making them right. Which in pastry, in the baking recipes is so important. And then like every step is outlined really well and it's all just super clear and foolproof, even though some of them are kind of complex. I think that's where you see his pastry background probably is that mm. attention to detail. Was there anything in there that you saw that you might cook at a later stage? There's loads, actually. Things that really struck me mm -hmm. were the fried butter beans. Ooh. And I think it's got it's feta and sorrel. Yes. He suggests you can change the sorrel because I've never seen it in a shop. So No, we used to have it, I think, in our garden growing up, but I've never seen it actually for sale. No, nor me. And that's that's it. I, I feel like the only people I know that, have, that eat sorrel get it from their garden, their allotment. Yeah. So is it a weed? That's my question. These people you know, in fact, rabbits. 
<laughs> Damn it, you got me. Um, okay, so the butter beans, anything else that you that took your fancy? And the, um, your, the, the tofu that you made is definitely yeah. on the list because I secretly quite like tofu. And I, yeah, I think it's just ways of making it delicious that needs to be explored more. I think that tofu scramble, honestly, is an abomination and should be legally outlawed but again that's for another time but the the other thing i really like the look of was the smoky frittata oh yeah it's like loads of eggs and scamorza cheese <gasps> just looks amazing Ooh. and like very decadent yeah i might try that for some nice weekend breakfast <laughs> when <laughs> i never have to leave the house afterwards <laughs> which is all the time at the moment how about you is there any any things that you you haven't yet cooked that you'd like to cook yeah a lot uh i think the pre lentil galettes yes they look so good we were gonna we did like a retro christmas um volivon display (laughs) edible display (laughs) and i considered making them uh there's also there's green pancakes with lime butter they look amazing yeah anything with lime anything with butter and weirdly mostly just because I'm intrigued by the kind of concept of hot dairy (laughs) is the hot yogurt and broad bean soup yes hot dairy that's the name of my new band (laughs) (laughs) it just looks like and and I don't even know if the photo does it justice it looks like a you know like a vat or something you might <laughs> dying <laughs> no I'm just I'm really intrigued by hot yogurt and broad bean soup I will wait until I see broad beans in the shops and maybe give that a go and uh drop it around to yours <laughs> you do some guinea pig. they have to be fresh broad beans uh, can you get dried broad beans I literally just might have just made up a bean <laughs> dried beans oh life's too short for dried beans I disagree because I I wish to be the kind of person who cooks beans from dry a dried bean girl (laughs) one of those dried bean girls on Instagram I wish to be them is that not the name of your band (laughs) dried bean girls in hot dairy my first album is as as a hot bean girl is called hot bean (laughs) girl That's something entirely different. (laughs) On that note, let's give Ottolenghi a rating. Okay. Let's try and guess Hannah's rating. I mean, I think we need to talk about our rating first, our very sophisticated system. That's very true. So each episode for each book, we rate them. We take into account usability, accessibility. So are the recipes easy to read? Can you follow them? What ingredients are used? <laughs> it's gonna, it's, it might go against Lotta Lenga on that one. The aesthetics of the book. So do you want it on your bookshelf? Is it going to be pushed to the front? And the fifth and most important one, is it veggie friendly? And so each week then we have a different item to rate with. Yeah, we had Nigella. What was she? We had to rate her off. Innuendos out of five. So for your time, we're going to do what? Well, I suggested aubergines, but... Apparently that wasn't appropriate. <laughs> We're going to give Ottolenghi a rating of obscure ingredients out of five. How many obscure ingredients out of five would you give Ottolenghi? Ottolenghi's plenty, not him as a man. He would get five as a man, obviously. That's another podcast. <laughs> Where we rate people's characters. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be tougher this time, Vic. That's what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to the rules. I'm going to separate the chef from the book. I like it. And so I'm going to give this four obscure ingredients out of five based on the obscure ingredients if i'm sticking to the criteria we said ingredients use was based on things we have to hand we don't always have sorrel to hand apart from your little rabbit friends who deliver them or things like um you know i don't know even things like papaya or special chilies and things like that but aside from that everything else is amazing I think it's really easy to follow it looks great we like the cover we like the font we like the pictures very veggie friendly obviously being an entirely vegetarian cookbook and usability uh is great too (laughs) who doesn't love usability I'm a big fan personally (laughs) 
a practical and beautiful book with veggie recipes. So what, what do we need? I'm scared to ask, I'll be honest. I feel like I'm getting a bad rep based on <laughs> literally nothing. <laughs> In episode two. In episode two, I am the bad cop. But that is not true. No, no, you're lovely. We like you. <laughs> Thanks. I can stay, guys. I'm also giving it a four, obscuring through exactly the same reason. It's beautiful. It the recipes are really easy to follow. They're not technically difficult from the ones I read. There's nothing, you know, ex- exceptional about any of them in that sense. They're obviously very veggie friendly. Um, I would love to have it on my bookshelf. I unfortunately have to give it back to um the library service, otherwise I'll be charged. But yeah, I just don't think it's as accessible mm. as it could it could be. Yeah. And that's on an ingredients level, but also in terms of like equipment. So I couldn't have made my dish unless I had I've got like a mini chopper. I I mentioned the chopper every episode now. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly it's great. Don't have a food processor, but have this mini chopper and it's changed my life. Are you looking for another free mini chopper? Is that why you keep would you care to mention, you know, your favourite brand of mini choppers or what you've been coveting? The one I've got is, is by Ninja. Oh. And I like it because it comes with <laughs> two two pots in which you can stack in your fridge so you uh, don't have to decant. Yeah, if I didn't have my beautiful little chopper, which I love with all my heart, I couldn't have done my recipe. And I think there's a lot of that. The, the, your, your tofu is the same, right? You need some kind of processor for a lot of it or or different ingredients and that makes for me it not as accessible as it could be for everyone yeah I could have done with your chopper actually I think there's like a dozen shallots and like 16 spring onions and and multiple garlic cloves so no nobody's got the time for that <laughs> well except we do because we're all just in our houses slowly <laughs> decaying <laughs> but in six months time I certainly won't have time for that and everyone will want the chopper so obviously this appears many times on the lists of best cookbooks that we came across. It's number 40 in the Observer Food Monthly's best cookbooks of all time. Wow. There was a, of which there was 100. So of all time ever. So we are saying with our much coveted cookbook circle rating that we agree that we think this is it deserves a place on the list. Yes, I think it does. And I think if you are thinking of buying it and it's, it's not very very expensive then you should yes or get it from your library yeah I think he's got quite a few of the recipes on his website various bloggers and whatnot have kind of done their thing with it I think he's gonna sleep well tonight knowing that he's got our endorsement <laughs> yeah he's been stressing about this it's okay Yosham we love you for me more than most <laughs> you made it on to episode two what, a, what an <laughs> honor Do we want to say what book is next or are we leaving it a surprise? Uh, we could say it's not going to sound as veggie friendly as, as this one. <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> unveil this very um, retro choice that we're working on now? Yeah, so the next episode is going to be on Simon Hopkinson's Roast Chicken and Other Stories which is a book that neither of us had heard of until we compiled our list and is incredibly old school. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. It is. I mean, the title itself is really interesting, Roast Chicken and Other Stories. I don't feel like Roast Chicken had the happiest ending, but (laughs) here we are. I can't wait to see how the other stories end. (laughs) With a chapter called Brains that can only go one way. (laughs) Hannah's making the brains. <laughs> I'm sticking with the chicken. <laughs> I'm doing tofu brain scramble. <laughs> Gross. On that note, we will see you then. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Cookbook Circle. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and let us know what you think by leaving a review. You can see how the recipes from this episode turned out on our Instagram, at Cookbook Circle. And if you make anything from the books that we talk about, please don't forget to tag us. We'll see you next time. Bye! Bye. Bye.